立法會主席。The President. Justin, Dai Hong Justin, Jay White. Question. Question number one, Mr. Tony Jay. Meeting is in progress. Please keep quiet. Please、um, act in a solemn manner. Mr. Tony Jay, I'm serving you a second、uh, warning. If you yell in your seat, I'll regard you as、um, misconduct. Following press reports last month that the Hongham Station extension works of the Sha Tin Central Link had works quality problem, the MTR Corporation Limited or MTRCL admitted that its staff members had detected on five occasions during the inspections between August and December 2015 non-compliant works, which include the steel bars being cut short. And not screwed into couplers to the required depth. In this connection, the government informed this council one, as the aforesaid works quality problem was detected on as many as five occasions within five months. Whether it knows why MTRC still maintained that its frontline staff members were not required to notify its board of directors and the government of such problems on the grounds that they were not persistent. Two, as the government undertook. In 2015, in response to an expert panel's report on the works delays and cost overruns of the Hong Kong section of the Guangzhou-Shenzhen-Hong Kong Express Rail Link, that it would improve the monitoring and reporting work of the railway projects, of the details of the monitoring and reporting mechanism, whether the government has deployed staff to conduct regular inspections on the SL SCL project. And perform random checks at the hold points. If so, of the reasons why the aforesaid works quality problem still occurred. If not, why not? And three, apart from holding the MTRCL accountable for the aforesaid works quality problem, whether the government will also pursue the responsibilities of the main contractor and his subcontractors concerned and impose penalties on them. Secretary for Transport and Housing. President, my reply to the various parts of Honourable Tony Jay's question is as follows: 
We are very concerned about the reported incident of the cutting of steel reinforcement bars at the platform of Hongham Station under the Sha Tin to Central Link or SCL project. We received the report submitted by the MTRCL on June the 15th. The report states that the statements given by one of the subcontractors of Leighton Contractors Asia Limited or Leighton are not consistent with those given to the MTRCL by Leighton, who has strenuously denied the allegations. The MTRCL did not express any opinion on this matter. According to the information provided by the MTRCL separately to the highways, the Highways Department considers that the matter may involve criminality, and the Highways Department has therefore referred the matter to the police for follow-up action. The government has no comment on this matter at this stage. As regards other contents and technical information in the report, the Highways Department will thoroughly examine and request the MTRCL to make clarifications or provide supplementary information if necessary. The Highways Department has already required the MTRCL to employ an independent third-party expert to carry out low tests. At the same time, the Chief Executive announced on June the 12th the decision on the setting up of a commercial inquiry under the Commercial Inquiry Ordinance Cap 86 to conduct an independent and comprehensive investigation in order to allay public concerns. One, the report submitted by the MTRCL on June the 15th does not elaborate the rationale for not reporting to its board and the government when the frontline staff of the MTRCL discovered the problem in quality of the works. The Highways Department has reminded the MTRCL that being the project manager of the SCL project, the MTRCL has to strictly comply with the responsibility under the entrustment agreement including verification of facts of all related issues and ensure the quality of works of the SCL. The MTRCL was entrusted by the government to design, construct and commission the SCL project. According to the entrustment agreement between the MTRCL and the government, the MTRCL warrants that the entrustment activities shall be carried out with the skill and care reasonably to be expected of a professional, including the assurance of quality of works up to the standard required. The Highways Department, with the assistance of its Monitoring and Verification or MNV consultant, is responsible for verifying whether the MTRCL has complied with its responsibility under the Entrustment Agreement. The Highways Department and M&V consultant visit the sites of SCL regularly. In general, about six to eight works contracts are visited in a month, and the works contracts of Hong Hum is visited about once every three months. However, as Highways Department's monitoring and verification role is to check the checker, that is, verifying whether the MTRCL has implemented the relevant procedures according to the specified requirements. The Highways Department generally does not check at the whole point on site, and the MTRCL is responsible for such checking. On structural safety, depending on whether the project is located within unleased land or leased land, the design and construction of the SCL is governed by different mechanisms. Regardless of the type of mechanism, structural safety requirements of the project also have to be on par with the requirements of work supervision under the Buildings Ordinance Cap 123. Tapping the experiences learned from the incident of XRL project, the Highways Department has implemented the following measures since mid-2014 to progressively strengthen the monitoring of expenditure, financial position and progress of the SCL project. First, deployed additional staff since mid-2014 of Railway Development Office SCL project team to strengthen monitoring works. Two, submit a monthly progress report of SCL uh, to THB and adopted the traffic signal system to express uh, 
concisely and precisely the progress and financial status of the project. Three, the MTRCL should give a briefing on the change in contingency, particularly where substantial sum is involved. The MTR MTRCL shall brief Deputy Director or above of the highways on changes involving large sums. Four, arrange them and VE consultant to attend monthly project steering committee meetings under the chairmanship of Director of Highways. Five, establish a working group with highways, the MNV consultant and MTRC to review regularly the program and progress of the SCL with focus on critical works procedures. Since June 2014, the government and the MTRCL have submitted quarterly reports on the works of progress to the subcommittee on matters relating to railways, or RSC, of LegCo and attended the RSC meetings in response to queries from members. The site in the central project is still in progress. When the project is completed, the MTRC shall submit the required documents and completion report, including the test report and inspection records to the government for examination and confirmation. In addition, the Highways Department, in collaboration with the MNV consultant and relevant departments, participates in the pre-handing over inspection of the MTRC before the relevant works are handed over to the government. Three, the expansion works of Hong Ham Station under the Shatin Central Link is carried out under works contract number 1112 signed by the MTRC and the Leighton. In accordance with the entrustment agreement, the MTRC is required to ensure that the contractors and subcontractors employed are of a level of qualification which is consistent with those required by MTRC for implementing railway projects. The MTRC, as project manager, shall ensure all the design requirements are reflected in the works contracts signed with the contractors and subcontractors in order to ensure that the quality of works comply with the requirements of the entrustment agreement and the works carried out by the contractors and subcontractors are in compliance with standards during construction. In addition, if any serious violation involving safety and quality is found, the Buildings Department may consider taking legal or disciplinary action against the relevant persons under the building ordinance. Mr. Tony J. President, other than Hong Ham Station, the Tokwa One Station and Convention um, Exhibition Centre Station are found to be um, suffering from uh, quality problems. Other than the contractors, maybe the uh, MTRC and the government's supervision uh, has uh, left something to be desired. Other than um, all the measures adopted in the mid-2014, until um, the COI findings and the police uh, investigation results are available, what action will be taken to restore public confidence in the uh, infrastructure uh, projects? Secretary? President, thanks very much, Mr. Jay, for the question. Regarding the supervision of um, railway projects, all along the government has uh, three levels of supervision. First, on the part of Highways Department, it has the Project Steering Committee, and meetings are held on a monthly basis to review the design construction uh, of um, the projects and procurement. Uh, post tender quality control and all the um, claims uh, for for compensation and so on the meeting will be um, discussing all these and the committee will be submitting a report to the highways department on a monthly basis to bring the department up to date and an assistant director level uh, will be meeting with um, the project managers of uh, the MTRC about the progress and regarding the progress and timetable, um, they will discuss all the implications on the progress and the timetable and all the interface matters. Third, two chief engineers um, of the highways um, on a monthly basis will be meeting with MTRC regarding the uh, civil engineering work and they will be discussing um, the, the uh, progress and understand the um, progress of the project. If there is any delay, um, report uh, will be made um, and restore the progress. 
And the Highways Department has also engaged M and V consultant to assist the department in monitoring. And through regular site meetings and visits, they will look at um, the public safety and um, expenditure and so on. As regards um, the recent um, problems in Hong Ham, Toka Wan, and Exhibition Center stations, we noticed that our frontline staff, when carrying out their work, um, spotted um, some of the problems. But indeed, uh, in terms of um, the internal reporting, uh, things um, are very disappointing. The SL government, including the THB and the Highways Department, it is only through the media that um, we learned about the issues, and we are we find this wholly regrettable. We urge the NTRC to do a better job in terms of monitoring on site, and they should urge um, the, their colleagues to, when identifying problems, report the problems upwards to to um, to the board, um, and through the board, a report can be made to the government. We hope that um, in the days to come, to come, we will urge the MTRC uh, to follow up on the relevant issues. The Highways Department and the relevant consultant uh, will follow up on the issue um, on the basis of what I said. And we will get to the bottom of the matters and identify those uh, who are responsible and plug uh, all the loopholes. Mr. Vincent Cheng, thank you, President. President. The SCL uh, project is um, a project that the Kowloon West um, residents have been waiting for. Now, we have uh, seen safety concerns. We've seen um, the, the rebars being cut short. Members of the public will ask uh, whether we're going to see the fourth and the fifth uh, scandals. Of course, we don't want to see this happen. Now, these are exposed by the media. The MTRC seemed to be unaware of what happened. It shows that there is a lack of communication between the MTRC and the subcontractors. The SCL uh, will be serving the members of the public. Will the government uh, be reviewing the mode of operation? Will the government be reviewing the monitoring and supervision mechanism? Like there should be an additional layer of um, supervision, and the government uh, should um, conduct a random checking of the uh, subcontractors and the contractors. Well, there was a whole barrage of questions. You may um, choose to um, answer um, any of the questions you like, um, Secretary. In the light of our experience, indeed, uh, there is room for improvement. And also in the light of uh, what happened recently and in the light of our experience, uh, we will review um, the arrangement to see whether there can be a better way of uh, dealing with the issues. In relation to what happened uh, recently, I hope uh, you understand that the government's team is um, seriously following up on the matter. And in terms of uh, criminal criminality, uh, we have uh, referred um, the, the matter to the police for follow up. As to the uh, liability on the technical side uh, of the equation, our colleagues are following up on them. Our attitude is uh, being one of um, being open and frank. As soon as uh, we have um, the results available, we will try and make them available to the uh, members of the public. And in, in the process, uh, we hope that we will be able to switch public concerns. Ms. Claudia Miller. Now, all these um, official um, incident reports, um, they seem to be uh, saying that um, these are none of um, the, the responsibilities of um, the people concerned. That we have uh, the, gov the MTRC has been lurching from, from uh, scandal to scandal. In many other jurisdictions, if there are serious problems like this, at the top 
uh, the top uh, person will be resigning to take responsibility. Let me take this, uh, put this to Mr. Frank Chen. Are you going to step down to take responsibility? If not, why not? Secretary, President, thanks very much for the question, Ms. Bo. Now, with uh, regard to any incident, we have to get to the bottom of the issues. We have to find out who should be held responsible. We have to find out what actually happened that led to this disappointing uh, situation. Third, and most importantly, we have to make sure that um, public safety uh, will not be compromised and work progress uh, will not be adversely affected. The immediate priority is um, to get the issue resolved. As to who should be held responsible, I'm sure that um, this uh, will be something for the public in the future. Well, the question has not been answered. Are you going to step down to take responsibility? Do you think that you don't have to take responsibility? Mr. Roy Kwong, President. Now, we had the uh, short piling incident. Um, Mrs. Ms. Rosanna Wong uh, stepped down to take responsibility. Now, this um, SCR is um, full of shorty work. The THB is um, certainly responsible. In September last year, there was an uh, email sent to the THB uh, to, um, to ask them to follow up on the matter. Let me put this to you, Secretary. Ms. Bowe's question is very straightforward. Is there any government official who should be held responsible? Are you going to uh, bow out and uh, to, to take responsibility? Secretary, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kwong, for the question. According to our record and according to um, the facts, in 2017, uh, on the 12th of September, we have uh, received uh, an email uh, from China Technology. Our colleagues uh, have already referred the um, email to the team, relevant team, for follow-up. The Highways Department has also a follow-up on the matter, and on September 15th and 16th, we got in touch with um, the China technology. In the process, um, the uh, China technology told, told us that uh, the matter has been resolved. And at the request uh, of our colleagues, um, we asked them for email confirmation. And on, on September the 18th, an email confirmation was issued to say that um, the concerns have been addressed and there was no need for further meetings. In the email, it was pointed out that uh, we don't need to follow up on the matter. So under these circumstances, uh, our colleagues couldn't take the matter any further. And we follow up with the MTRC, and we hope that uh, through other channels uh, we would be able to get to grips with the details of the issue. From the MTRC, we learned that they would work um, in cooperation with us but they have to ascertain uh, what the matter was all about. Now, until we have further information from the relevant party, we couldn't follow up on the matter. So the whole story is very clear. Whether someone has um, uh, got it wrong, I'm sure it is very, very plain. Uh, Mr. President, will the Secretary be uh, resigning um, to take responsibility? No supplement? No. Mr. Dr. Martin now. President, the MTRC submitted a report um, regarding SCL. Indeed, um, there were flaws uh, in the supervision, and there was um, no upward uh, reporting to the government, and there was a lack of internal reporting. Now, the MTRC um, issued um, the non-conformance uh, report. Is it uh, really binding? or? Can the contractors or subcontractors decide whether they should be able to um, continue with the work according to their judgment? Secretary, thanks very much, um, Dr. Martinell. As I said in answer to uh, some of um, the members regarding the uh, exhibition center station, uh, we are very disappointed with uh, what happened. If the MTRC has already issued a non-conformance report, the um, work has to be halted until 
um, an independent um, consultant has assessed the situation and, and come up with um, a remedial measure. Dr. Liao uh, said that whether there is any um, statutory power to bind them, that this is part of the, the um, supervision system. Under normal uh, circumstances, if a contractor has been um, issued with a non-conformance report, it has to uh, hold the work until such time as um, the remedial um, measure has been identified and approved. And in this um, issue, and there were more than one uh, incidents, and there was um, there were problems with um, the supervision, and has been going on for for some time. And we we saw uh, another non-conformance uh, report before our work was halted, and this is uh, wholly unacceptable. At the moment, uh, we are liaising with the MTRC as to what actually happened in the process. Why? Uh, did they allow this to happen in the process? Well, I'd like to get to the bottom of the issue and uh, bring members up to date. Second question, seeking an oral reply, Mr. Kwai Kang. Thank you, President. The annual progress report on the long-term housing strategy submitted by the government last year set a public-private split of 60-40 for the supply of housing units and a public housing supply target of 280,000 units for the 10-year period starting from this year. However, the sites which have been identified by the government so far can provide only 237,000 public housing units in the coming decade. On the other hand, the waiting time for applicants on the waiting list for public rental housing has been increasing continuously in recent years, and the prices of subsidized housing units which have soared in tandem with the heating up of the property market are beyond the affordability of the public. Regarding the supply of public housing, will the government inform this council, one, whether it has commenced a study on the inclusion of public housing in the development project on the top side of the MTR Silho 1 depot, if so, of the relevant considerations and the expected completion date of the study, as well as whether the scope of the study covers the devotion of the entire project to public housing development. Two, whether it will revise the price setting mechanism for subsidized housing units so that the prices of units are pegged no longer to market prices but to the affordability of buyers. And three, whether it will consider raising the proportion of public housing in the overall housing supply target from 60% to 70% so as to address the keen housing demand of the grassroots, if not for the reasons for that. Secretary for Transport and Housing. Thank you, President. After consulting the Development Bureau, my consolidator reply to various parts of the question raised by the Honorable Kwok Wai Kang is as follows. Since the promulgation of the Long-Term Housing Strategy, LTHS, in December 2014, the government updates the long-term housing demand projection annually and presents a rolling 10-year housing supply target. In determining the annual housing supply targets from 2014 to 2017, the government adopted a public-private split of 60-40 for the supply of new housing units to underline the government's commitment in increasing public housing supply while ensuring the stable and healthy development of the private market. According to the LTHS Annual Progress Report 2017, the total housing supply target for the 10-year period from 2018-19 to 2027-28 is 460,000 units. Based on the above ratio of 60-40, the public and private housing supply targets are 280,000 units and 180,000 units respectively. When considering the above set ratio, we should take into account that given both public and private housing are in short supply, we should strike a balance between the demand for public and private housing in determining the future supply targets. Regarding the pricing of subsidized sale flats or SSF, the current mechanism has in place an affordability test. Under normal circumstances, Home Ownership Scheme HOS flats are sold at 30% discount from their assessed market values. However, if the affordability criteria cannot be met, a higher discount can be offered under the existing pricing mechanism. Nonetheless, during recent discussions on the relevant subject, some members of the Hong Kong Housing Authority 
have expressed views on whether the existing pricing mechanism can more effectively address the affordability of applicants. The public is aware of public concern about whether prices of HOS flats have gone beyond their affordability. At the recent Legislative Council Chief Executive's Question Time, the CE indicated that she would personally look into the subject. As regards the topside development at Siho Wan Depot, as part of the multi-pronged strategy to increase land supply, the Development Bureau has been working with the MTRC to explore the development potential of railway-related sites. According to MTRCL's technical studies, the top site development at Siho Wan Depot can provide no less than 14,000 flats and related community facilities in the medium to long term. To make the best use of land resources, the government has commenced the statutory planning procedures in return in relation to the top site development at the site by zoning the site for other specified uses, railway depot and public transport interchange with commercial residential development. The relevant procedures are underway. The draft Siho Wan Outline Zoning Plan OZP was gazetted for public inspection from the 29th of March 2018 to the 29th of May 2018. The Town Planning Board will conduct public hearings later. The government is aware of the demand for public housing in the community and will take this into consideration in the planning work of the development project. The Siho Wan Depot site is currently granted to MTRCL for use as a railway workshop and a maintenance depot. In taking forward the top site development, it is also necessary to ensure the normal operation of the workshop and that the depot is maintained in supporting railway services. Various development details, including the housing type and ratio of the top site development and the need to provide the Siho Wan railway station, etc., are to be further examined and discussed by the government and MTRCL. Among others, it is necessary to consider the interface between the depot operations and top site development, matters on lease conditions, financial and implementation arrangements. How MTRCL as the current lessee and depot operator will participate, etc. The major principle is that the development potential of the site should be unlocked in a timely manner to meet the public's keen demand for public housing through practicable arrangements in the public interest. The draft OZP gazetted in March 2018 specified that after the site is zoned for other specified uses, any future proposed commercial residential development in the zone requires the submission of a layout plan to the Town Planning Board to obtain planning permission. By then, the commercial residential ratio and the ratio by housing type will be set out for the Town Planning Board's consideration. Thank you. Mr. Kwok Wai Kang. Thank you, President. The latest batch of HOS is fetching almost $10,000 per square foot. If you still pack it to market prices and you also go for the affordability test, a family whose income is $57,000 is eligible. So it's really difficult to get a unit. It's even more difficult for winning the Mark 6. The community has the consensus for lowering HOS prices. Well, if you only go for a bigger discount, you are thinking that near enough is good enough. I'd like to ask you when you will actually depeck the price of subsidized sale flats and market prices. STH, thank you for the question. We understand that the pricing of SSF and that it is quite removed from the level of income of the public. We have also heard a loud cry that prices of SSF should be depacked from market prices. We have heard you loud and clear. At the housing panel and all, on other occasions, we have said that the present pricing mechanism of SSF has had consideration for people's affordability. And we have said that the discount rate can be adjusted. The CE has indicated clearly that she would personally look into the subject And uh, there will be a decision made very soon. 
on that premise, let us allow time and space for the government team to work, and then we will make an announcement when we have a decision. And you will know the details. At this point in time, I shouldn't comment too much on the subject. Mr. Andrew Wen. Thank you, President. According to LTHS, the supply of private housing will exceed demand. We have completed 70% of the supply target in the first five years, but public housing is lagging behind. The housing panel carried a motion moved by me last year to enhance, enhance the ratio to 7 to 3. Mr. Kuo, I can ask the question, but STH did not exactly reply to that point. My question is, whether you will formulate a mechanism for providing a flexible ratio mechanism. Say you go by a five-year supply cycle, and according to the progress of supply, you will be able to make adjustments sooner. STH. Thank you, Mr. Wen. With regard to the ratio between public-private housing, yes, we have heard your loud voices saying that it should be enhanced to 70 30 instead of 60 40. We understand that even if the ratio is 60 40, the supply target is that we have to turn out 280,000 public, pri uh, public units in the next 10 years. But as of date, we can only supply 237,000 units given the land we have. Therefore, even since we already have to work hard when the ratio is 6 to 4, if we enhance it to 7 to 3, um, it might not be possible, and our answer is that we will do our best. And we have been cooperating with the Development Bureau. Say, sites that have been zoned for private housing have been rezoned for public housing. And we are doing planning adjustments to the 210 sites we have identified so that we can provide more public housing. Overall speaking, we need to balance the supply of public and private housing. When property prices are still on a very high level and beyond the affordability of the public, if we lightly change the ratio, we may be dispersing and uh, a not entirely correct message. And there may be changes done to the market. And market performance may venture beyond what we would like to see. Therefore, I can tell you here that with regard to housing supply, the government team has been working continuously and at our level best. With regard to ratio of public-private housing, we are doing our best to strike a balance. And on that premise, we have committed and promised that if grassroots cannot afford to buy their home, we will do our best to provide public rental housing so they have a home. Mr. Vincent Chang, thank you, President. Many people are talking about modular housing, or Mr. Tony Chair has said that we could add floors or stories to existing buildings. I'd like to ask you whether uh, you will give special financial or policy treatment to such proposals. Will you set up a special task force to look into this? STH, thank you. When there is a tight supply of public housing, well, in the policy address 2017, we have put forward a series of measures to provide transitional and community housing so that people in the queue for PRH will be relieved in terms of their living conditions with regard to modular housing and Mr. Tony Chair's proposal to add units to existing public housing. We are working to look into those proposals. In fact, Mr. Tony Chair had a meeting with the housing department earlier on to uh, have an in-depth exchange into the proposal. Besides, under the Development Bureau, as, as we said in the budget, $1 billion have been put aside for organizations 
to apply to use short-term vacant government land and also short-term vacant or idle buildings for that to be turned into housing purposes. We will work towards those targets and uh, we will also work to meet the public's aspirations. Later on, we will try to see what more can be done and we are most interested in members' proposals. Mr. Jimmy Ng, thank you, President. Land supply is has a lot to do with the supply of public and private housing. Actually, on the 6th of June, I asked about private housing supply and STH said that the Siho Wan depot site is of mid-term or medium-term potential, but you have not talked about the supply of spade-ready sites. And this time around, the STH is giving the same kind of reply. The Tong Chong line is operated in such a way that the top side development will belong to the MTRCL, but that is not the case for Siho Wan Depot. You can actually get back this spade-ready site for public-private housing or even for public housing alone. This is a, something good for meeting the public's housing needs. I'd like to ask you, in order to achieve your 10-year building target, will you act in a more proactive way, and that is to build a land bank of spade-ready sites? STH. Thank you, President. Thank you. I'd like to clarify the situation of the Siho Wan depot site. Right now, it is leased to MTRCL with a private lease for use as a railway workshop and a maintenance depot from 1995 to 2050. However, we do agree with the member that um, if both sides find it acceptable and if it is feasible and in line with the public interest, we should release the potential of any site that can be used for housing. We will be happy to give it a try. Whether Siho Wan Depot site is a leased site or government site, well, we have a very positive and open attitude towards that. As for a bank of spade-ready sites, as you know, the Task Force on Land Supply is con conducting consultation on short, medium and long-term land supply. The public is being consulted and we are collecting your views. We hope that after consensus is forged in society, we can have a common understanding how land should be supplied so there will be fewer disputes and our work can get started more smoothly. Uh, we hope to hear from you on this. And of course, when we have a consensus, when we need to look for land and form land, I'm sure the Development Bureau and the TH Bureau will join hands and work very closely together. Mr. Wu Chiwai. Thank you, President. Regarding the Home Starters program, you are going to supply the site um, on Anderson Road at the end of the year to carry out a pilot scheme. And those units will be calculated towards the supply of private housing. Let's ask you this. Apart from supplying a site, can you do something bolder, like using the URA as a lead organization and allow it to supply land for the home status scheme, that is to use land resumed from redeveloping old districts so that the URA can play a part in providing land for this program. STH, thank you. With regard to the role of the URA, of course, it is responsible for urban renewal and its mission and objectives are very clear. In the process, the URA has done many things which are innovative to relieve the burden of the public in terms of housing, say, for example, in purchased units. The URA 
has allowed welfare organizations to provide community housing. As for the URA helping with home starters, well, we have an open attitude, but we must consider that the URA is financially independent, and it said some time ago openly that if the land resumed by it would be used for public housing, um, using the housing prices um, in the vicinity for an exchange, it will be difficult. Well, today, uh, if you read the papers, you will see that some of them have reported the situation. In any case, the entire team in government from the CE and uh, to every one of us, we are very concerned about the housing needs of the public. Anything that is in line with the public interest and um, anything that can shorten the queue for PRH, we are all years. Ms. Alice Mack, STH, you don't need to say much. It is not um, any report in the newspapers. The URA chief executive said yesterday that he would consider using the Ma Tao Wai project um, as a project for sale below market prices. So, in fact, if um, this is done already and uh, this is already a second attempt, I'm sure the URA will be able to do more in the old districts. Um, it started with De Novo, of course. But this is not my question. In your reply, you said that you would do housing need projection under the LTHS, and you have come up with a ratio of 6 to 4. We have been asking you, for example, to increase the supply of private housing. And you said that there might be an effect on private housing. And now you have a new kind of thinking. You're thinking about charging a vacancy tax or vacant property tax um, in the first hand market. So shouldn't you adjust the ratio now? Because when you mapped out the LTHS, there was no consideration of imposing a vacant property tax. If now you are thinking to do that, why can't you take the opportunity to adjust the public-private ratio? If you are willing, it will be easier for the public to support you in finding more land to develop public housing. Thank you for the question. Indeed, as Ms. Mack just said, the government team is studying into different proposals, but we haven't made any decision and without any public announcement, nothing um, is for sure as to whether when we have new policies and we can take the opportunity to adjust the 6-4 ratio, we have an open attitude towards that. But let me reiterate, we have now the 10-year housing supply target. And we are saying there should be the supply of 280,000 units in the public sector. And we have only identified land to provide 237,000. In other words, we still lack land for 43,000 units. Therefore, our immediate target is to try to catch up. And while we are doing that, we should try to do this now instead of enhancing the ratio. I think what we are doing is more pragmatic as to whether we can have more sites for public housing. Well, we are trying to do that, and we are having a comprehensive discussion within the Bureau. When I answered other members, I said that in the past and in the present, we have succeeded in rezoning land zoned for private housing into land for public housing. And we have made planning changes um, in 210 sites so that they can be used for public housing. Question number three, Mr. Gary Fan. 
The government announced last month the rolling out of a three-year technology talent admission scheme (TACTAS) to implement a fast-track arrangement for the admission of overseas and mainland technology talents. Regarding the acquisition of right, the right of a boat in Hong Kong by persons who came to Hong Kong under various admission schemes, well, the government informed this council one of the respective numbers of persons who applied for and were granted entry into Hong Kong in each of the three、uh, past three years under the Quality Migrant Admission Scheme, the Capital. Investment Entrance Scheme, the Admission Scheme for Mainland Talents and Professionals, and the Immigration Arrangements for Non-Local Graduates, as well as the number of persons who had come to Hong Kong under the various schemes, acquiring the right of a boat in Hong Kong in the past three years, with a breakdown of the figures and their percentages by mainland resident and resident of other regions. Two. Given that the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation and the Hong Kong Cyberport Management Company Limited will be responsible for examining the tech test applications submitted by the tenants, incubators, grantees, or occupants, as well as making recommendations to the Innovation Technology Commission (ITC) on the applications concerned, of the criteria adopted and the mechanisms based upon by these two companies and ITC when considering the relevant applications, and three. Given that under Tech Task, ITC will consider admission applications from technology talents who do not meet the relevant academic requirements but possess good technical skills in specialty areas, proven professional abilities, or relevant experience and achievements. Of the criteria adopted and mechanism based upon by ITC when considering such types of applications, the specific measures to be put in place to ensure that Tech Tests will recruit the technology talents needed by Hong Kong without becoming nothing more than a shortcut for mainland residents to acquire the right of a boat in Hong Kong. Secretary for Innovation Technology, Mr. President. My reply to the question raised by Mr. Gary Fan is as follows: A, according to the information provided by the Immigration Department, the statistics on applications received and approved under Quality Migrant Admission Scheme, Admission Scheme for Mainland Talents and Professionals, Immigration Arrangements for Non-Local Graduates, and Capital Investment Entrance Scheme for the past three years are set out at Annex One. The statistics on persons approved for admission to Hong Kong under the immigration schemes mentioned in the question, who have acquired right of abode in the past three years, are set out at Annex Two. The immigration department does not maintain statistical breakdowns by region of applicants who have acquired. Right of a boat. B and C of the reply. Persons admitted under the Technology Talent Admission Scheme (TACTAS) must be employed by an applicant technology company or institute, and be engaged principally in conducting research and development R&D in Hong Kong in the seven technology areas of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, cyber securities. Robotics, data analytics, financial technologies, and material science. On academic requirements, persons admitted should be degree holders in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics (STEM) from a well-recognized university. Well-recognized universities refers to the top 100 universities in the latest publications of STEM-related ranking tables of QS, Times Higher Education, and academic ranking of world universities. Those with a bachelor's degree. And a bachelor's degree only should possess a minimum of one year of work experience in the relevant technology area, while those with a master's on and、uh, or doctoral degree are not subject to a work experience requirement. Persons not meeting the academic requirements as mentioned above, but possessing good technical skills in special areas. 
proven professional abilities and our relevant experience and achievements supported by documentary evidence can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis under exceptional circumstances. Upon receiving quota applications from its tenants on, or incubities, the Hong Kong Science and Technology Parks Corporation, HKSTPC, and Hong Kong Cyberport Management Company Limited, the Cyberport, will examine the material submitted and make recommendations to the Innovation Technology Commission, ITC. ITC will take into consideration HKSTPC's and Cyberport's recommendation before deciding whether or not to approve the quota. Each quota application will be assessed on its own merits, having regard to the following considerations. A. The knowledge or skill sets of the required technology talent must align with the applicant company or institute's technology activities. B. The number of quotas requested is justified for the applicant company or institute. For example, having regard to considerations such as business volume, venue and expansion plans of the applicant company or institute. C. The applicant company or institute has demonstrated genuine difficulties in recruiting local talent in the technology areas concerned and for the academic qualifications or other expertise as well as the remuneration packages of the required non-local technology talent are suitable. One of the key requirements of TACTAS is that at the stage of quota application, the applicant technology company or institute should demonstrate that talent with the relevant skills, knowledge or experience is short in supply or not readily available in Hong Kong. This is to ensure that TACTAS can effectively assist technology companies or institutes in attracting technology talent in shortage in Hong Kong from around the world to conduct R&D in Hong Kong. Similar to persons admitted under the other admission schemes as mentioned above, persons admitted under TACTAS who have ordinarily resided in Hong Kong for a continuous period of not less than seven years may apply for the right of abode in Hong Kong in accordance with the law. TACTAS will not become a shortcut in applying for the right of abode in Hong Kong. Mr. Gary Fan, Secretary hasn't answered my question, especially part three of my question. According to your main reply, all the figures... Uh, demonstrate the number of applications approved under various schemes and for mainland residents approval rate reached over 90 percent and for IANG we see that the figure is still on the rise in 2010 of the 3,976 applicants approved under IANG 2,170 of them got right of abode in Hong Kong in 2017, and the number is on the rise. Well, regarding the uh, what's uh, mentioned in the main reply, because of uh, insufficient gatekeeping efforts on the part of the government, there is no proof uh, from employers as to the genuine difficulties in recruiting local, local talent. Or, for example, the remuneration packages um, is on average lower than the average uh, packages for locals. And yet, in your reply, I don't see any specific measures implemented to plug this loophole. As a result, these schemes are exploited by mainland residents as a means to obtain right of abode in Hong Kong. That's the crux of my question. They are all related. Please answer my question. Thank you, Mr. President. Regarding Mr. Fan's question, our table sets out in a very clear manner the situation regarding talent emission schemes. For example, emission scheme for mainland talents and professionals, a migrant, a quality migrant emission scheme, etc., and if we look at the breakdown of figures regarding different categories, these talents are not uh, so-called uh, technology talents. In fact, we have another breakdown. Uh, such as the column QMAS. 
In fact, regarding the talents um, admitted to Hong Kong, they over the past few years they were mostly coming from the arts and culture sector and the financial sector, and they are not um, technology talents which we are targeting uh, this round. As for gaining or acquiring the right of a bolt, the percentage represents um, a figure with a lagging effect. And in fact, as you can see from the figures, the number of applications for acquiring right of a bolt is in fact on the decline. Dr. Martin now. Because the application threshold for tax has is relatively lower according to the sector. Uh, this may result in a mismatch of talents. We may not be able to attract the um, medium to high level technology talents. On the contrary, we may even stifle the, uh, the ecology for local technology talents. I want to ask the Secretary whether they have kept any statistics about local graduates of STEM um, disciplines so as to gauge our long term competitiveness. Secretary, thank you, member, for the question. Over the past few years, we've seen a shortage of technology talents in Hong Kong. In the face of global competition for talents, this is especially true. In Shenzhen, Taiwan, Singapore, and Japan, different measures are put in place to attract high end technology talents. As for STEM education in Hong Kong, every year we have 8,567 um, local graduates and research graduates. So uh, when devising the scheme, we have a 3 to 1 plus 2. Apart from attracting foreign talents, we also encourage local enterprises to recruit local graduates. And also um, local students as interns. That means we must attr attract foreign technology talents as soon as possible, whilst at the same time, we must put in place measures to encourage development locally to groom talents in the long run. This will help address the issue. Because we may have um, IT companies conducting financing companies uh, activities in Hong Kong, but are unable to recruit local talents. And in fact, the scheme is targeted at seven specialty areas. At the same time, through the scheme, we can cultivate local talents so that the majority of our young people can remain in our INT sector. Mr. Jimmy, thank you, Mr. President. I think the technology talent admission scheme is too focused on attracting talents, but not focusing enough on retaining talents. As to how we should retain talents, I think it all boils down to uh, addressing the uh, needs of these talents, such as uh, the, the children's education and accommodation. I understand in Zhuhai, they have a dedicated department to address the issue of um, the uh, the employment issue of spouses of talents. And in Shenzhen, there is a slogan, as long as you're here, you are you belong uh, you are part of Shenzhen to cultivate a sense of belonging. I want to know in terms of retention of talents, what specific measures will be put in place and of the details. And after the applicant um, comes into Hong Kong. I wonder if the government keeps any statistics as to how long they stay. Secretary, thank you, Mr. Ng, for the question. About retaining technology talents who have come to Hong Kong, we have a number of supporting measures. International schools is one example. In recent years, we have identified more school premises for more international schools. We have eight new international school campuses providing 6,000 places. On the other hand, in the past few years, 
as we understand that uh, there are more and more international schools operating in Hong Kong. Uh, and at the same time, we understand we should target young people, and the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park uh, will be building a smart space or inner space, which will provide accommodation and other facilities. That means suitable accommodation for foreign technology talents. So as to keep the technology talents in Hong Kong. We can supplement this information to you, Mr. Ng, uh, after the meeting. Mr. Ng. Well, my understanding. Well, what question hasn't been answered? Well, there are more and more international schools. But will there be a special scheme um, implemented by the government so as to make it easier for children of these foreign technology talents to be admitted easier? Well, please follow up on this issue at another location. Mr. Pun Xiuping. I think this tech test. Uh, is a duplication of other immigration schemes. It's nothing but window dressing. And in the annex, there is a table that shows that more and more talents are admitted under these schemes, and there are more and more applicants acquiring right of abode. And according to your Reply: The ITC, the Innovation and Technology Commission, will consider recommendations made by the Science Park and the Cyber Port before uh, granting, deciding whether or not to approve the quota. So the ITC will be the uh, vetting agency. But in fact, there have been criticisms. For example, about the information manager. The criticism is that uh, the pay is lower than the average uh, and in Hong Kong, and there hasn't been any local recruitment efforts. Well, approval will be made by the ITC. Um, is there any measure from the government to enhance transparency to, to, uh, to combat abuse? Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Member, for the question. This is a pilot scheme. We proposed a scheme to address a situation, and that is um, we have many uh, innovation technology company startups in Hong Kong, but they cannot recruit sufficient local technology talent. And under this scheme, um, the screening will be uh, conducted by the Science Park and the Cyber Port. They have to confirm that uh, recruiting local talent in the technology areas concerned is genuinely difficult, and the ITC will consider approving the quota, whereas ultimately it is the Immigration Department that is the gatekeeper. Under the pilot scheme, we seek to address a problem, that is shortage of local Technology talent, and it is a, it is a very focused scheme. We're talking about talents in the seven specialized technology areas, and we propose to review the scheme in uh, six or seven months to gauge its effectiveness. Um, each quarter would only be approved for twenty four months. And the immigration department will act in accordance with the relevant rules and criteria in deciding whether the working visa will be renewed. Mr. Charles Mock. Well, when the ITP announced the tax task scheme, they decided on a quota of 1,000. According to the SCMP's report today, the Bureau consulted the Science Park and Cyberport in coming up with this projection. But according to the ITC upon inquiry, um, it was just a rough estimate, uh, not a proper projection, uh, no documentation. And if the ITC itself 
uh, doesn't attach importance to analysis and data at all. What's the point of promoting big data and data analysis? Well, um, being late is better than never. Are you going to um, make an assessment or analysis into uh, on the number of graduates and number of foreign talents required? Thank you, Mr. Mock, for your question. In drawing up the scheme, the Hong Kong STPC and the cyber port have been in liaison with technology companies on a regular basis, and we are part of the global race. Uh, Mr. Mock, you would know that in neighboring cities like Singapore and Japan, they have various talent schemes to attract lo global talents. Uh, we seek to put in place a fast track arrangement to approve quotas, and we also have a long term manpower um, in this, uh, uh, planning to look into um, addressing the shortage of uh, technology talents. So that's a fast track arrangement, but in the long term, we also conduct uh, more in depth studies on a uh, manpower requirement. Well, um, he didn't answer my question. You said a study has been conducted. It wasn't conducted. Are you going to, co to conduct a study? You need to conduct a study. So are you going to conduct a study that which you claim uh, have, has been done? Anything to add, Secretary? Well, mainly I'd like to add that we have a new arrangement, and this is a pilot scheme. As I mentioned just now, we want to implement the scheme as a six-month pilot Following that, we'll conduct a review. At the same time, we also um, study the uh, shortage of uh, technology talents. So this is a two-prong approach. Question number four. The Honourable, oh, we do not have a car.
，系啊。What is your problem? Speakers of mic. Mr. Gary Chen. Thank you, President. The usual practice in this council is when our members are not、uh, at their seats or when it's not yet their turn to speak, the props should not be displayed on their desks. And I can see four now. Can、uh, you deal with the problem, Liz? Although there is nothing in our own OP on the display of、uh, props or articles in this chamber, usually the president will、uh, consider whether the props are relevant to the subject and whether there is any issues、uh, with safety and、uh, blockage of sightline. Well, as you pointed out,、uh, the four members are. Not in their seats, and the、uh, displayed objects are irrelevant. So I direct that the secretariat remove them. Mr. Lam Chakting, President,、uh, can you please pause while I'm discussing with the president? The president. Well, I don't. I I think it's harmless to、uh, wait for an other minute. Members urge you to chair our、uh, council meetings in a fair manner. I think that is relevant to our council meeting. Lam Chao Ting Yun. Mr. Lam Chao Ting, it's been reported that quite a number of residential buildings newly completed in recent years were constructed with bay windows fitted with glass curtain walls, installed with decorative components on external walls, and had air conditioners and drainage pipes installed in concealed locations on the external walls. Such design features have added difficulties to repair and maintenance works, such as the work locations being inaccessible from the inside of the buildings. Since scaffolds cannot be erected on the external walls of some buildings, the more expensive condolers are needed 
to be used when works are carried out on the external walls, thus increasing the financial burden on property owners. Furthermore, due to the design constraints of some external walls, gondolas cannot get close to the work locations. As a result, workers have to stretch their bodies out of the gondolas when carrying out works. This compote coupled with the gondolas swing in the wind, has increased the risk of workers falling from height. In this connection, what the government informed this council, one of the number of industrial accidents in the past five years in which workers fell from height while carrying out works on external walls of buildings and the resulting casualties with a breakdown by whether the relevant works were carried out by using scaffolds or gondolas, to whether it will formulate policies and guidelines to stipulate that the needs of future repair and maintenance works have to be taken into account in the building design so as to minimize the need to carry out works at height and to ensure that scaffolds can be erected on the external walls for carrying out the relevant works and three of the measures put in place to step up the regulation of works on external walls of buildings which are already completed so as to protect the safety of workers working at height. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. President, the government attaches a lot of significance to work safety at external walls of buildings. Under the Occupational Safety and Health Legislation enforced by the Labour Department, responsible persons, including contractors or employers, have the duty to conduct specific risk assessment before commencing repair and maintenance works at external walls. And they have to give due regard to uh, the work environment and conditions, such as the design features of buildings. And based on the results of uh, such assessment, formally appropriate working methods and procedures that are safe and to adopt safety measures. LD or Labor Department promulgates codes of practice or guidelines. It pu publicizes and uh, promotes work safety. It uh, will carry out routine inspection to ensure the safety of workers working at external walls of buildings. The government also understands the importance of building design to work safety at external walls, and relevant departments are actively following up the issue. After consulting the Lab Development Bureau and the Buildings Department, the Labor and Welfare Department uh, the Labor and Welfare Bureau's reply to the three-part question is as follows. From 2013 to 2017, there were 13 fatal industrial accidents involving workers falling from height during renovation and repair works carried out at external walls of completed buildings, resulting in the death of 40 workers. Of these, 11 had to do with uh, erection, dismantling, or use of scaffolds. None of them involved the use of suspended working platforms or ASW. SWPs. According to investigation conducted by LD, there was no evidence showing that the design of the external walls of uh, these buildings were not suitable for erection of scaffolds for works. LD does not maintain statistics of non-fatal accidents relating to repair and maintenance works at external walls. As regards the design of new buildings, in 2016, the in or in the beginning of 2016, the BD introduced new measures to encourage the industry to provide ancillary facilities for repair maintenance of external components such as air condition uh, platforms and um, also curtain walls and uh, when the industry applies for exemption uh, for these features to be exempted uh, from calculation of GFA, uh, they have to follow the following guideline. The BD issued the circular to the industry in December 2016, promulgating guidelines for designing access and safety professions for the maintenance and repair of external air conditions at height. The guideline set out the requirements regarding adequate working spaces around ACs, appropriate ex access, etc. Upon issuing of these guidelines, development projects were the first general building plans approved by BD involving exclusion of ACs platforms from GFA calculations should comply with the guidelines and provide relevant ancillary facilities. A working group was set up by the BD with representatives from LD and the building industry in 2017 to review the guidelines for designing AC platforms to facilitate workers um, to carry out repair work safely. The working group also reviews requirements for installing casting anchors devices on external walls to complement the use of safety belts. BD will consult the building industry later on the proposed provisions to the guidelines of AC platforms following the established procedures. And BD is now 
considering alleged amendments to the Building Construction Regulations Cap 123B. There will be provisions to require the provision of general safety facilities in building design to facilitate future repair maintenance works on external walls. When the amended regulations come into force, BD will require authorized persons to provide information on facilities for external repair of buildings such as working platforms that conform with legislation related to occupational safety and health. Such facilities must be specified on the building plans for consideration and approval by BD for compliance with the proposed revised provisions. To complement the proposed amended legislation, uh, BD is formulating guidelines on the design of access for repair and will consult the industry according to the established procedures later. Three. LD is responsible for enforcing the Occupational Safety and Health Ordinance Cap 549 at the Factories and Industrial Undertakings Ordinance Cap 59 and their subsidiary legislation. LD inspects uh, these areas outside uh, office hours and they carry out special operations targeting high risk works such as working at heights. They send officers to carry out surprise inspections on works carried out external walls of buildings to deter um, practices that are not in compliance with the safety regulations. This will ensure safety of works. The legislation stipulates the safety requirements for work at height, including works carried out external walls and uh, to comply with, and they include erection of uh, safe working platforms, uh, such as provision of secure fences, safe access and egress, and suitable for arrests for working platforms to protect the occupational safety of workers working at height. On working at height, LD publishes COP or guidelines such as the Code of Practice for Bamboo Scaffolding Safety, COP for Safe Use and Operation of SWPs, Guidance Nooks on Classification and Use of Safety Bells and the Anchorage Systems, etc. They set up practical operational requirements and measures for general working environments and condition to help contractors and employers understand and comply with the legislative requirements and the responsibilities under other ordinances. On this basis, LD will review and update the relevant COP guidelines from time to time to reflect the changes in the general work environment. However, the design of building walls where varies. Contractors and employers have the duty to conduct specific risk assessments before commencing repair and maintenance works, external walls. And they include uh, giving due regard to the actual work environment and circumstances such as the unique uh, f building design. And based on the results of risk assessment, they have to formulate appropriate working methods and procedures that are safe and adopting necessary safety measures. And that could include the provision of suitable working platforms and for resters for workers and ensuring their proper use in order to comply with statutory work safety requirements. Where necessary, contractors and employers should seek professional advice. Mr. Lam Chakting, President. In uh, part one of the administration's reply, there were 13 fatal accidents causing 14 deaths in between 2013 and 2017. This is worrying. Many newly completed uh, buildings have very uh, fancy designs, but they are not practical uh, at uh, light wells and also external walls. They are not suitable for S. WPs to operate and uh, the SWPs may uh, swing in the air and the building materials have made a scaffolding difficult because they do not have sufficient uh, concrete walls uh, for cantilevers to be installed. So very often workers have no choice but to uh, erect a scaffold at an inappropriate location causing great risk to uh, workers. In part two of the reply, it is said that in 2016, the BD introduced measures to require the provision of uh, ancillary facilities for repair and maintenance. That is uh, the prerequisite uh, for exemption of calculation of GFA. Does that mean that so long as uh, there is such a provision, but uh, workers may have to ban uh, to a large extent to uh, carry very heavy objects such as air conditioners. Is that sufficient? 
uh, is there sufficient safeguard for the workers and also the owners concerned? Secretary for Development. Thank you, Mr. Lim, for your follow up question. SWPs have been used widely in Hong Kong. According to the uh, guidelines by the Labor Department, in the installation of curtain walls for cleansing of windows and building of, uh, of uh, exhaust uh, for uh, buildings and in carrying out maintenance and repair works, uh, engineers and workers may use SWPs to work on the external walls. However, the design of building varies and other ancillary facilities may be needed. Um, canty uh, levers or even cranes may be used. So um, even though there is a SWP, that doesn't mean that uh, the access is safe. It all depends on how the works are being carried out. Mr. Lok Chong Hong, President. There are so many fancy building designs and strange building plans that are not practical and our maintenance of external walls are very difficult. You cannot erect a scaffold and even if you can, uh, you have to install uh, three uh, blast um, uh, screws into uh, the um, external wall and uh, should there be an incident, uh, the company or workers concerned may be liable and uh, they might not have uh, followed uh, the guidelines for safe use of SWPs. Now for uh, erection of SWPs is difficult because many new buildings are as tall as 40, 50 stories and uh, uh, there may be high winds. And then uh, when it is windy, SWPs uh, may be uh, swinging in the air that's dangerous to workers. And I wonder if you know uh, how expensive it is to use an SWP, it can be over $10,000 for maintenance of an air conditioner. I'm coming to my question. So many such uh, strange uh, building plans that are fancy and impractical have been approved. Has there been any um, mistake on the part of anybody. Now, for new buildings, you can uh, improve the situation, but what about existing buildings? Will you just uh, allow the condition to continue? S Secretary for Development. I thank Mr. Look for his question. For uh, design of new buildings, as I, as we said in our main reply in 2016 or early 2016, we introduced uh, new measures in considering uh, applications for exemption of components of the exterior of buildings, such as air coin platforms and cotton walls from gross uh, floor area calculation, the provision of ancillary facilities for maintenance of such components is one of the prerequisites. And then in 2016, BD issued a circular to the industry providing guidelines for designing access and safety provisions for the maintenance and repair of external air conditioners at height. There must be sufficient space um, around the air con and then uh, there must be safe access for building plans approved after the promulgation of the guidelines. All buildings are required to provide these ancillary facilities for building plans to be approved. For building plans approved before that, after all, uh, these are guidelines, they are not requirements under the building's ordinance that must be complied with. So some buildings might not have followed the guidelines. But in approving new buildings, we have to uh, give a consideration to the prevailing building's ordinance in deciding whether the plans should be approved or not. Dr. Eleanor Wong, this question is about 
whether the administration will amend the relevant legislation to ensure that our buildings have a maintenance friendly design. Uh, it is said here that uh, the uh, BD is going to uh, study the building construction regulations. I'd like to ask uh, whether in addition to SWPs, you will consider uh, curtain walls that are already fixed and also reflexive material, reflective materials used uh, on uh, building walls because uh, these are also about uh, the um, uh, building or maintenance friendliness of buildings. So will you ensure that the BD in reviewing the building construction ordinance, uh, building design is friendly and scaffolds would, should be avoided as far as possible. Secretary for Development. Thank you. As said in the main reply, the BD is uh, considering legislative amendments to the building construction regulations. It may consider introducing uh, provisions to uh, require adequate safety facilities in building design to be provided to facilitate future repair maintenance works on external walls. When the amended regulations come into force, BD will require APs to provide information on facilities for external repair of buildings, and that covers not just the ACs but external walls as well. And there must uh, be working platforms that comply with the occupational safety and health legislation, and such facilities must be specified for the building plans. And to complement the proposed amendment, BD is formulating guidelines on the design of access for repair and will consult the industry uh, according to the established procedures. Mr. Ho Kai Ming, I think the Secretary doesn't understand the uh, matter thoroughly. We have conducted site visits to uh, construction sites. Uh, the FGU has followed has been following this issue for a long time. We understand that safety access must be provided to ensure the safety of workers. But for some new buildings, they are already time bombs because they're already uh, completed and you must uh, use SWPs to carry very uh, heavy objects such as uh, the uh, uh, main plant of ACs and then a few years down the road, you may have uh, to replace the AC plant, and then uh, owners, property owners, may have to spend uh, tens of thousands of dollars per maintenance exercise, and then uh, workers will have to carry AC plants that are as heavy as a few tons on SWPs, so they will become time bombs. I hope that the administration will tackle this problem ASAP so that workers will not be uh, at risk in the future. Secretary for Labor and Welfare, I do understand members' concern for this subject. Under the current arrangement, whether it be the contractor or the employer, he has to carry out the uh, risk assess assessment I mentioned. Now, if an SWP uh, cannot uh, be uh, used and if a scaffold cannot be erected, then uh, they will have to consider uh, what m measures and methodology to adopt to ensure safety. They may have to seek professional advice. For instance, uh, where necessary, there should be uh, sufficient uh, hanging structures protruding from the uh, walls of the building to support ACs. However, design of buildings does vary. We cannot uh, specify uh, all the measures. Now, if uh, there are uh, facilities uh, that can be done at all events, then we are happy to consider their feasibility. Ms. Alice Mack, so uh, the Secretary uh, told us, uh, well, in fact, let me tell you, there are many such buildings where 
uh, such facilities cannot be provided. Now I said that uh, the um, Labor Department is responsible for enforcement of occupational safety and health legislation, and then you have all sorts of uh, guidelines. According to the COP for um, uh, for building scaffolding safety, three uh, wedge anchors have to be needed. How can you have uh, three wedge anchors on curtain walls? How can you have a safe SWP? These design features are fancy but not practical. All right, in 2016, you published uh, the design, but what about buildings completed before that year? And uh, you have uh, been reviewing uh, the use of SWPs uh, since 2017, but buildings are being built, and uh, these buildings are more and more expensive. Workers have to work um, uh, with their life at risk. So, uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Ho Kaiming talked about uh, workers are having uh, to lift a very heavy ACs using SWDs. So, are you going to address the current problems? Secretary, now if we talk about a uh, curtain wall, if SWP can be used, then SWP can be used. It's not necessary that a uh, scaffold has to be erected. But some just now a member said that what if a scaffold uh, could not be erected and SWP cannot be used? How can maintenance be done? Now I am not. Uh, I'm a layman. If we really have uh, this scenario, we have to uh, ask a consult a professional whether it should be a uh, bottom up or top down or from inside uh, to outside, outside to inside. I know the issue is complicated, but professional advice is needed. If um, professionals have suggestion, now our intention is to enhance. Workers' safety, and if there is anything we can do to help uh, um, employers and property owners to uh, tackle this problem, we're happy happy to do that. Mr. Griffin, I, I Mr. Aunokim, I just ruled that uh, the uh, articles displayed are irrelevant to this subject, and please remove them. What is your point of order? I'm of the view that uh, the um, article here is relevant to uh, this meeting. I hope that uh, you will not abuse the ROP. I hope you give us the um, authority to display the placards. And this is uh, to uh, refresh your memory. I thank you for your uh, commendation. But uh, Mr. Gary Chen has already pointed out that uh, your displayed object is irrelevant. Mr. Gary Chen said that I was not here. I already made my ruling. Uh, please remove your object. So do I have to beautify it? Mr. Gary Fan. Question five. Oh, sorry. Question five. Speaker, not on mic. I just made my ruling. Please um, put down your placards. Question five, Honorable James Cho. Mr. Alakin. Quorum call. Please put down your placards.
。同緊新議。Honourable James Cho。It was reported in the year before last that the police found in the props company a large number of replica banknotes, which were claimed to be used as film props. The owner of the company was convicted last month of possessing counterfeit currency notes and sentenced to four months imprisonment, suspended for two years. Angered and shocked by the judgment, some members of the film industry point out the authorities had never issued clear guidelines. On the legal requirements and reproduction of banknotes, nor they had carried out publicity in this respect, resulting in members of the industry breaching the law inadvertently. In this connection, will the government inform this council one, whether it has plans to draw up for the film industry a more flexible and simpler application procedures for reproducing banknotes, including making the application form and the detailed requirements available on the website of the Film Services Office. FSO, so as to encourage members of the industry to file applications in accordance with the law. If so, of the details. If not, the reasons for that. Two. Given that the representatives of the FSO, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority (HKMA) and the police discussed the relevant issues with members of the film industry yesterday. Of the views and suggestions put forward at the meeting, as well as the outcome. And three, whether it will consider establishing a regime to regulate the film props industry, under which only those props companies approved by the government may design, produce, and rent out props of a high degree of resemblance to the genuine ones, such as replicas of banknotes, guns, police warrant cards, government documents. So as to strike a balance between supporting the production of high-quality films and prevention of the illicit activities. If so, of the details. If not, the reasons for that. Under Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. President, according to Section 103 of the Crimes Ordinance, Cap 200 of the Laws of Hong Kong, a person who reproduces on any substance whatsoever, and whether or not to the correct scale, any Hong Kong currency note or any part of the Hong Kong currency note, must first obtain the consent of writing of the HKMA. My reply to Honorable James Toe's question is as follows. On question one and two, in view of the concerns raised recently by the film and television sectors in relation to applications for reproducing Hong Kong currency notes for filming purposes, the Film Service Office of Create Hong Kong, under the Commerce and Economic Development Bureau, has actively followed up on the case by liaising with different industry associations and listening to their views. Evers owed. Act as a facilitator and line up a meeting yesterday, the 19th of June, for industry reps to exchange views directly with the HKMAs and the police. Industry participants include representatives of the Federation of Hong Kong Filmmakers, the Hong Kong Televisioners Association, the Hong Kong Film Directors Guild, the Hong Kong Film Assistant Director Association, the Film Hong Kong Film Association, and the Hong Kong Movie Production Executives Association. At the meeting, to ease the concerns of the trade, detailed explanations were given on existing application procedures and compliance requirements for using propped Hong Kong currency notes for filming. The police also elaborated on the established follow-up arrangements, including the requirements on storage and destruction of the propped currency notes. Parties at the meeting also discussed ways to enhance the trade understanding of the relevant guidelines, with the view of achieving a suitable balance. Between meeting the trace expectations and effective crime prevention, in particular to facilitate the trace understanding of the requirements under the guidelines, HKMA will provide the application guidelines in Chinese, which has now been uploaded to the HKMA's website for easy reference. A link to the guidelines has also been provided on the FSO's website. HKMA will, in due course. Attached to the guidelines, a set of samples demonstrating the required size of the prop currency notes and distinguishing design and features that would set the prop notes apart from the genuine bank notes. An application form will also be attached to the guidelines to facilitate applicants filing out of the required information. Question three. Making props is a professional segment of the film and TV sector. As per every so understanding, while there are a number of prop companies providing different props for the industry, most of the props used for film productions are specifically procured 
or produced by art directors of individual films to suit the specific filming needs of the particular film concerned. Given the tremendous variety and type of props and the different requirements of and for props peculiar to productions, it would not be cost effective for the government to standardize the regulations of the making of different props, a move which would also dampen the creativity of the industry. Currently, there are established procedures for and guidelines on using pop notes on modified firearms for filming purposes. The relevant authorities would also take into account of consideration relevant to their project concern in granting permissions. It is therefore too difficult to standardize the handling of props across the board for the production of certain props such as identity and warranty cards of government officers or logos of government departments, FSO would assist obtaining consent for the relevant departments and show no infringement of copyrights. FSO will also continue to provide appropriate assistance to the trade in handling other filming issues. Honorable James Toe, and President, from the government response, the government is of the view that we haven't made any mistake in the past. It's just, I uh, just want to enhance the trade understanding and to facilitate the sector. So, where the application has was made, you uh, you uh, refuse it right away, or even not close to applications for some time. I wouldn't even. Get into that now. So looking forward, the government said oh, we plan to streamline the procedures. This morning, I spoke with the uh, some members of industry and wonder if the government will further consider. So, since uh, environmental friendly and to support industry and we don't need to destroy the notes, can the government provide a certain number of uh, stage money? at the FSO for storage that could be available for a loan so that the uh, person responsible and can return this stage money to the government for reuse or uh, take a reference and elsewhere that if it's complied with a certain standards they could exempt from application or need to make a simple notification to uh, deploy a certain quantity of legally compliant um, props money without going through the complicated procedures. Under Secretary, thanks for uh, Mr. James' so supplementary question. As for why the HKMA uh, would not accept applications back then, at in end of 2017, there were a few applications and filed, and there are a few criminal cases concerning counterfeit notes that have been investigated. And for a period in sake, the HKMA uh, replied that it would not accept the applications for the time being. Uh, and however, it, it uh, forgot to no, that is a temporary and not accepting applications. And um, to have HKMA has since clarified. I um, agreed with uh, James Toast that we should look for it for the past few weeks together with yesterday's meeting and those in the industry and our colleagues have uh, been having a cooperative attitude. The trade most wish to see that the application procedures and the guidelines uh, can be set out clearly. For the past week, even yesterday meeting, and we able to achieve that. And the HKMA had undertaken that the guide, the lines, and the procedures will be as streamlined and the approval time. Now we talk about two weeks. If the uh, trade can submit the paperwork on time, the approval time can be further compressed. And for Mr. James to said whether for the go government will consider uh, manufacturing some. Uh, prop money for the trade to use and for the uh, production of uh, banknotes it is the um, expertise of the art directors and for the different uh, film projects they would have a different ideas and um, prop money is only one of the many things uh, under the prop segment and for the abbess or receive uh, many types of uh, requests in the past, there are about a dozen or so that had to do with uh, props money. So the abbess uh, mainly achieve, 
assistance on uh, shooting on locations, for example, uh, uniforms, uh, logos, or um, a request of documents will, will continue to play the role of facilitator and coordinator. So in terms of the actual uh, re reproduction, so like we said in the past week or so, if they don't mind to, to uh, adopting the existing practice, they just want to wish the uh, guidelines and the application procedures to be clearly set out, which we managed to do. Mr. Alok Hin. And President, I noticed that on the second point on the re reply, that on the uh, restriction on the reproduction, for example, it have to be a uh, bigger or smaller than twenty percent, or uh, not allowed to have watermark. That would actually uh, reduce the authenticity of the props. That in, in other countries, um, the government will instruct a authorities to uh, lend. Uh, Props money for shooting purposes. Will the bureau consider this uh, practice so as 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 to uh, retain the authenticities of the props in the film? Thank you for it, Mr. Al. Supplementary question. As per the guidelines for the detailed application procedures, and the guidelines have been uploaded to the website. Like Mr. Al said, uh, with him of the texture and the size. Um, so um, the requirement is to have bigger or smaller than 20%. Looking at the uh, samples uh, replica, so it had to be um, bigger or smaller than 20%. So looking at the real sample, there don't seems to be a major difference. So um, so maybe um, the, uh, through various shooting techniques and the angles that can able to remedy that and to uh, achieve a high resemblance. For the individual request in yesterday meeting, the HKMA is very willing um, to further explore with the trade to whether there is any uh, room for relaxation or offer discretion in some cases. So I would encourage uh, the uh, trade will uh, you use this channel, and the uh, FPO will continue to act as facilitator to um, communicate between the sector and the various bureaus. And like I said, uh, we will not uh, engage in the production of uh, props money. There already such supply in the market. Um, uh, the props money is one of the uh, one areas in the uh, props uh, making. Segment, for example, uh, for a shoot, uh, 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 shooting assistance allocation that require greater assistance from us. So we need to uh, balance our workload. So, and the trade in the yesterday's meeting and for the past few weeks have been satisfied with our re response and agreed to continue to cooperate along this direction. Mr. Ray Chen. And the fourth paragraph on the administration replied the HKMA will provide the application guideline in Chinese. And would upload to the HKMS website for easy reference. A link to the guidelines has also been provided at the FSO website, quote unquote. So these measures have just been implemented, but before that, the, uh, the HKMS website has not provided a Chinese version of the application guidelines. So on the FSO website, you couldn't find the relevant uh, hyperlink. So when uh, talking about the application and claim that the HKMA would not accept a request uh, to. Uh, Request on reproduction of the curious notes. You claim that um, the application closure is just a temporary. So do we have this film stop our film production due to your or uh, halting applications? Dude, there was so much ambiguity in the past, which you admitted, and somebody would like to uh, follow the law and apply for the permission, which was very difficult. If in the past the uh, the film members of the public broke the law inadvertently. Uh, for the government, whether for the FSO, the HKMA, or the CEDB, shouldn't uh, bore at least some of the responsibility? Under Secretary. For the uh, offense of the uh, person involved, whether the government or the certain bureaus should bear some responsibility. 
so uh, the decision to prosecute is uh, for the for the police to follow uh, the advice of the Department of Justice. As you know that it's the uh, persons uh, involved and uh, um, considering lodging an appeal, which we're not comment at this point. I'm not comment on specific cases. I'm trying to talk about the, under this situation. If the members of the public could, uh, could not follow the, all of those, we should govern bear some responsibility. And thank you for uh, President and Mr. Chen's question. Let me clarify that this uh, st uh, uh, statutory requirement and the guidelines are not uh, t t especially targeting the industry. In the past, we've seen members of the public uh, have suffered losses from this uh, props uh, money. So why we setting up this law is to uh, balance um, um, between assisting industry and protecting the public. Mr. James Cho, um, the main what he said doesn't appear in the main reply. So. So I will now uh, elaborate in my supplementary response. So uh, let me continue as for what Mr. Ray Chen was referring to. Why the MSO had not provided the guidelines or or uh, explained it in the website. So in my supplementary response to questions, I have seen that um the the trade. Uh, seems to have a uh, greater demands on uh, providing uh, shooting assistance on location. As for the uh, back, back those replica applications, there are only a dozen or so in the past. We uh, right away refer them to HKMA for handling. So, in terms of the uh, case law, there were that many of them. Uh, we have uh, made referrals in the past. And like James just said, we have to look for it and we can uh, further improve. So on the HKMA's website and the MSO website, we have uh, included the relevant information. Mr. Yip Kin Yun, uh, I only had a simple question. I claim that if uh, members um, bro uh, broke the law in accident, uh, would the government bear some responsibility, yes or no? We had the responsibility to explain clearly um, the ordinance, the application procedures, and the guidelines. For the past few weeks and yesterday, we uh, done that. Mr. Yip Kin Yun. The HKMA's uh, respond to the, uh, uh, the TV and movie industry demands. I think they've uh, addressed Keisha accordingly. On the issue of the profs money, so also involved more than the uh, TV and movie sector, also involved the education sector. Uh, you might find it clear. I'm referring to uh, special schools. I uh, receive. Uh, request for assistance for uh, special school teachers. They're worried they might break the law by accident. When they're teaching the students, they uh, need to uh, use uh, back notes to teach certain things. So in order to avoid um, the uh, children being uh, deceived, they have to be um, highly resembled uh, replicas as teaching aids. So. Um, I was quite concerned. Back in 2012, on July 22nd, it has reported that the uh, parents had raised this issue of the use of uh, replica back notes in special schools. So, it, small amounts will be involved. So, coincidentally, um, some uh, reporters have solicited the views of Mr. James Cho. So, I may ask the administration that responding to the needs of the TV and movie industry to have to pay attention to the needs of the special schools. I notice that the um, reproduction of Hong Kong currency notes as stage money general guidelines, one of the information that we provided would be the name of the film on the TV program. So if you are applying as a school, that wouldn't be applicable to you. So as currently there's no way for them to apply. Would And then how do we uh, meet the needs of these special schools? Will the uh, government uh, consider this seriously? Your question is uh, not uh, well. So within the scope of the main risk, I'll still let the secretary respond. And for the past decade, um, the HKM has received over six hundred applications. Some of them uh, have to uh, application for education purposes. So the HKMA uh, will uh, handle it properly if necessary. Um, if education sector would like to. Uh, 
know better about details. For example, uh, like the um, meeting yesterday, I'm willing to uh, facilitate a meeting if required. Mr. Ma Phong Kwok. The trade has a few concerns, and the, uh, for example, time needed for the application approved, and the uh, quantity uh, requested have often a uh, request, and also the uh, authenticity um, is not satisfied. We have a very, very few requests. However, we see a lot of uh, scenes featuring back notes in um, TVs or movies, so that would put the trade in a difficult spot. Some don't even know they need to apply, as some of them chose not to apply because the process is too cumbersome. So I agree that we should look forward. On yesterday meeting, which I attended with the industry reps, at the meeting, a lot of the concerns have been addressed it and understood that the trade is willing to uh, abide by the laws. And for the remaining concerns, and yesterday we have received a few undertakings and uh, were able to um, resolve them in the f future implementation, the trade is still worried. Um, please ask your question. My question is, if after some time uh, implementing the trade, uh, still some think that some of the demands could could not be met, so can we consider setting a licensing system as per uh, the regime on modified firearms, where you would issue licenses where the uh, professional uh, props uh, company, on one hand, they will be directly regulated, and the other way they will provide a convenience uh, to the trade. Is this suggestion feasible, and will the government willing to respond? Of course, there will be under the premises that if the trade so required, will the government consider it? Thank you for Mr. Mao's question and your presence at the meeting, which will you provide a lot of valuable advice. Like in my follow-up response, we are aware that um, the trade speakers demand that um that the current guidelines and the regulations um, be uh, clearly set out. So uh, we haven't had as strong as a trade that urge for a legislation amendment or uh, to uh, having take the same approach on modified firearms. Of course, we will continue closely liaise with the trade and with Mr. Ma. If someday the, the trade has such uh, views, we'll keep an open mind. Yeah. Last question seeking an oral reply, Mr. Ho Kai Ming. Point of order. Call for quorum.
。各位议员 ，Members， please take your seats so we could count the quorum。各位議員，請返回座位，以便點算法定人數请议员返回座位。Members, please take your seat. We have a quorum. The meeting continues. Secretary for the financial for financial services and treasury. I haven't asked my question yet. Okay, sorry, Mr. Okaming. Thank you, Madam Deputy. It has been reported that last month our company was placed into voluntary liquidation and made more than 100 employees redundant. Among them, more than 40 were members of an occupational retirement scheme company known as Also Scheme. However, since the liquidator has all along not furnished the employees' information to the trustee of the Also Scheme, the employees concerned have so far been unable to withdraw the benefits totaling $40 million under the Also Scheme. As the Also Scheme has been granted mandatory provident fund MPF exemption, the mandatory provident fund schemes authority MPFA. Is unable to provide assistance, and the trustees has only advised them to request the liquidator to furnish the relevant information expeditiously. Regarding the regulation of also schemes, will the government inform this council one of the current number of also schemes that have been granted MPF exemption, whether it knows the respective re current numbers of employees and employees who have joined such schemes and the total accrued benefits under such schemes? Two. Whether a liquidator is required under the existing legislation to furnish within a certain time frame the account information of the also scheme of the company in liquidation to the trustee of the scheme. If not, whether the government will enact legislation in this regard with a view to expediting the relevant procedure, and three, whether it will study the enactment of legislation to include also schemes in the regulatory scope of MPFA. Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury. Madam Deputy, the objective of the Occupational Retirement Schemes Ordinance Cap 42. Six, the ordinance is to establish a registration system for occupational retirement schemes, also schemes voluntarily established by employers, to ensure that such schemes are properly regulated, and to provide greater certainty that retirement scheme benefits of these schemes promised to employees will be paid when they fall due. Employers who operate also schemes that fall under the ambit of the ordinance are required to apply to the Registrar of Occupational Retirement Schemes, that is, the Mandatory Provident Fund Schemes Authority (the MPFA) for registration or exemption of their schemes. When the MPF system was launched on the 1st of December 2000, registered schemes and exempted schemes under the ordinance may apply to the MPFA for MPF exemption pursuant to the Mandatory Provident Fund Schemes Exemption Regulation Cap 485B. With regard to the case of Voluntary winding up of a company, as mentioned in a question, after receiving inquiries from affected scheme members since the 17th of May about contributions held in the relevant also scheme, the MPFA has in fact immediately contacted the trustee, the third-party administrator, and the liquidator, urging them to handle inquiries from affected scheme members and arrange for payment of benefits as soon as possible. The MPFA has requested the trustee concerned to provide dedicated hotline service for account inquiries by affected scheme members and arrange a meeting with affected scheme members together with the MPFA and the liquidator for providing one-stop services to the scheme members. In response to Lashko members, the MPFA met with around 40 affected scheme members on the 31st of May. To learn about their concerns and explain to them follow-up actions of the MPFA, the trustee also met with the scheme members on the 13th of June together with the MPFA and the liquidator to explain the procedures for withdrawal of benefits and process relevant applications. 
My replies to the questions raised by Mr. Ho are as follows. 1. As at the 31st of March 2018, there were 3,358 MPF exempted also schemes, of which 3,149 were also registered schemes and 209 were exempted schemes. The 3,149 also registered schemes covered 4,955 employers and 327,911 members with assets totaling about 300.29 billion Hong Kong dollars. As for the 209 exempted schemes, they were generally offshore schemes registered or approved by overseas authorities or also schemes where the majority of members were not Hong Kong employees. Exemptive schemes are not required to provide such information to the MPFA. 2. The ordinance does not require a liquidator to send account information of an insolvent company's problem fund schemes to a trustee within a prescribed period. Under the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance, CAP 32, the main duty of a liquidator is to complete the winding up procedures of the company as soon as possible, including realization of the company's asset, payment of the company's debt, and adjustment of the rights of the contributories. That is, every person liable to contribute to the assets of a company in the event of its being wound up among themselves, etc. In general, the liquidator will first collect the relevant documents and member information and then process and verify such information as soon as practicable. After agreeing with members on the amount of their severance payments, the liquidator will pass the information to the relevant trustees for arrangement of offsetting and payment of members' assets. The winding up procedures will be carried out in accordance with the company's winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance, CAP 332. The time required to complete an individual task depends on the actual circumstances. 3. As mentioned above, or also schemes operating in or from Hong Kong are governed by the ordinance and fall under the regulatory ambit of the MPFA. Under the ordinance, registered schemes must comply with the statutory requirements in relation to assets, trusteeship, investment finding and other requirements related to act audit and actuarial review and disclosure of information to employees. Assets of a registered scheme must be separated from assets of the relevant employer. Thank you. Mr. Ho Kai Ming. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Just now the Secretary mentioned that uh, in this uh, process, the liquidator plays an important role, but the liquidator is not appointed by the employees. And the duty of the liquidator is to deal with the um, debts of the creditors. So the liquidator is not there to help employees to deal with certain th issues. Now, for other uh, also schemes, uh, uh, would you require that uh, these schemes be enhanced and so for the employees could um, um, receive their contributions as soon as possible? because uh, each uh, one has at least $900,000 in their MPF scheme. So could the government help them with that? Secretary, it's stated in the ordinance that uh, for registered also schemes, these assets must be separate from the assets of the administrator of the scheme. So because the assets are separate, so they will not be affected by uh, winding up or bankruptcy of the employer. For example, in this case, uh, when the, uh, the trustees receives all the revenue information, in about two months, uh, the employees will be able to receive their benefits. Now, Mr. Ho Kai Ming suggested amending the legislation to speed up the time for um, mem scheme members to receive their benefits. Well, as I said, um, the liquidators have various uh, duties. Now, they have to deal with the MPF and the also schemes, uh, but um, the primary duty of the liquidator is to complete the winding up procedure as soon as possible. Now, every case of liquidation is different, so the speed uh, in dealing with um, such cases would be different. So if we require 
the liquidators to submit information to a third party within a certain time frame, well, that may actually not help speed up matters, even if we make it a legal requirement. And usually liquidators are professionals, either lawyers or accountants. They have to observe their own profession code. And also uh, the trust uh, uh, liquidators have fiduciary duties uh, towards um, the uh, those who appoint them, such as the creditors or scheme members and so on. So we believe, therefore, there is currently adequate protection and regulation for scheme members and their assets and their benefits. Thank you. Ms. Alice Mack, the Secretary mentioned that many parties uh, had to intervene, the uh, MPFA, um, the Secretary and members. We did a lot of work so affected employees could receive their benefits within a certain period. But if um, amending the legislation cannot be done, are there other ways to make sure that um, liquidators would submit some information to uh, would pass some information to the trustee uh, as soon as possible when there's a um, liquidation, so uh, employees will get their benefits soon. Now at the moment there is no time limit, and uh, the, as you said, uh, the secretary mentioned the liquidators' primary du duties towards uh, the uh, creditors, and well, they won't may not care, you know. Uh, to employees, these benefits are the cash they need um, in rainy days, and they are made redundant suddenly. Secretary, well, a dozen or so of the employees lodged complaint with the MPFA. Their primary concern is. That the trust uh, whether their assets are under the trustees are fine whether they could get their assets back. When we met with the employees, the MPFA explained to them for the assets uh, under the also scheme, they have to be kept totally separate from the assets of the employers or the third-party administrator. So under any circumstances, as long as they follow the procedures, they need not be worried that they will not get their money back. Now, in some cases, because of um, winding up management, or because of a uh, protection of wages on insolvency issues, uh, there is need for them to seek assistance earlier. Well, then, under the uh, protection of wages on insolvency ordinance, there are arrangements for them to seek help from the labor department. That is, um, in such circumstances, employees may seek help from the labor department, and the labor department will assist um, such uh, affected workers. They will. Um, record their information, and also they will apply for extra payment under the perfection uh, of wages under uh, in, on the insolvency fund for wages in arrear and so on. So already under the, the relevant um, legislation, there is protection offered to employees, and there is also the PWIF to give advance payment when necessary. So it's not the case that we don't we wouldn't amend the legislation, but rather um, the Labor Department, the MPFA, and for the uh, and under the also schemes there is currently adequate perfection, so employees and benefits and interests would not be affected. Now for this particular case, for employees um, in, uh, affected. Um, in the also schemes, they are uh, in senior, mostly in senior positions with a longer service history. So that's why they are not um, members of MPF scheme, but rather they are members of the also scheme. Apart from uh, uh, wages um, in arrears or other uh, staff benefits, um, 
being a default, um, they are concerned uh, about um, the arrangement for the accrued benefits and when they could get them. But um, under the current legislation, there is sufficient means to make sure that um, um, proper procedures will kick in. And if necessary, the MPFA may also intervene and uh, liaise with the um, trustee and help the employees and so on. Mr. Lang Yu Chung, thank you, Madam Deputy. The Secretary said that there is now uh, legal protection, so employees need not be concerned because there are several funds or, or ordinances to help, uh, say, f with um, w uh, protection wages in, on insolvency or even with sovereign severance payments and so on. But um, for the also scheme, even though the benefits will be paid out, it will take a long time. And so it's um, mental torture for the employees. Now, the also scheme has separate um, accounts, separate assets. So even if the company is being wound up, um, the assets are totally separate. They won't be confused. Uh, with the, the assets of the company, so it has nothing to do with the financial problems of the company. So under the circumstance, how can the government ensure that um, employees will be paid their uh, due benefits, including retirement benefits in the shortest possible time frame? Um, oh, don't just tell us there are various pieces of legislation and funds to offer protection to employees. It's more than that. It's about the time frame. So how can you speed things up? That's the most important point, Secretary. Thank you for the question. When it comes to the time frame, in my reply earlier, I mentioned that under normal circumstances, It will be about two months that the employees will receive their benefits. Uh, just now, there's mention that um, there may be delays in the process. As I explained earlier, the liquidator has um, several responsibilities for also schemes or even MPF schemes of employees. The liquidator has to do with it as part of the winding up process. Well, each um, case of winding up is different, but under the companies winding up and miscellaneous provisions ordinance uh, and 241 and 242, now when um, the liquidator is appointed, companies' directors will have to provide a detailed statement of the company status um, at the creditors' meeting. And that should cover the names of all employees, as well as the estimated amount of claim by each uh, creditor. So when a liquidator is appointed, the company director would have a furnished such information to the liquidator. And as I said, uh, the liquidators have to deal with several issues. It, uh, they will also deal with the um, uh, trustees and third-party administrators, um, so their procedures follow, and then uh, information will be sought, uh, and so on. So there should uh, be due protection for employees. Mr. Holden Chow. Thank you. As a practicing solicitor, I would like to say this. Well, there is a legal procedure for winding up of companies, and there are many steps to follow, and there's need to seek court orders. In, in theory, uh, the liquidator should follow all the steps uh, one by one, including the creditors' meeting you mentioned. But my question is, is it possible that um, something could be hold, could hold up the process. For example, um, calculating the severance payments, uh, there's need to seek the consent of uh, company members. Or in um, 
um, working out the company's assets, you may encounter difficulties, or so you can't make the arrangement. That's why things are delayed. Is that possible? Because if you follow the procedures, and then in the course of that, you may need to make reports to the court and so on. So is it possible that uh, you are held up at uh, on such issues, or maybe there cannot be agreement on the severance payment amount and so on, or sorting out the asset um, declaration and so on? Is is that possibly the reason? Well, in this case, it's not the case because there's a third party administrator, so everything is clear. So this is not a pro This is not the case here. But I think Mr. Holden Chow has um, um, mentioned a good example. Why is it that we cannot have expedited process since the money is with the trust trustee, so you can just write a check right away? But uh, as I mentioned, for liquidators, when they deal with severance payments documents, first they have to verify the figures. They have also need to seek the consent of employees, and when necessary, uh, access in the scheme may be uh, used to offset the uh, severance payment and so on. So they need to do all the calculations. I won't go into details because of the time constraint, but I'm sure you're familiar with that. Um, uh, for, under also schemes, there are governing rules. Before um, dispersing assets to the employees, they have to consider whether they joined the scheme before the 1st of December 2000. Or after, because that's uh, when the MPF scheme started. If they joined after, then they couldn't um, have the full amount. Uh, that we have to work out uh, because the, the MPF uh, benefits have to be worked out, and these have to be transferred to their MPF account. So the minimum MPF min benefits will then be transferred to their MPF account. So there are a lot of details involved. So the liquidator would have to. Talk to the third party administrator and the uh, MPF scheme administrator. So it's not just a clear cut case of uh, collecting money. Thank you. Mr. Porche. Many members uh, asked uh, some questions. I understand the the problem is that uh, they, the, the follow-up started on the 17th of May. It's just a month now. So is that normal? Now, one case is too many, of course, but when a case like this does happen, what are the general procedures? If there is insufficient information uh, in a part two of the question, it says that uh, the law does not require the uh, trustee uh, to provide the information. But um, actually, in uh, Section 33, of uh, CAP 4626, uh, it says that uh, the, the uh, department could seek uh, all the information. So have you been helping in that respect? Secretary, yes, when necessary, we will invoke our powers. But in this case, the information is complete, and the third party administrator has already been in contact. So as uh, Mr. Chair said, this case happened in mid May since then, uh, much Liaison have been has been done. Meetings have been held. The third party administrator, the trustee, and the beneficiaries have had meetings, so they know that their benefits have not been affected in any way. It's just that it takes a bit of time for them to d deal with um, cases of those who uh, were employed after two thousand. So that uh, also benefits have to be transferred to MPF scheme and so on. So that's why it takes time to deal with such matters. Thank you. Government bills.